The railways of Africa developed as the result of 19th century colonial expansion, when the European powers vied with each other to get the biggest slice of territory to exploit mineral and agricultural resources. The result was an intriguing hodgepodge of railways with lines scattered all over the continent, often built to different gauges to hamper possible invasion attempts by neighbouring powers, and operated with a fascinating array of locomotives, many of which we shall see in this programme. We shall look at African railways, past and present, and see how dramatically some have changed, while others remain just as they were over half a century ago. We start in 1930, when the Tanganyika Concessions Company, with substantial mining and railway interests in Africa, decided to sponsor the making of a film called The Civilization of Africa. The idea was to foster the economic growth needed to justify completion of the famous Cape to Cairo Railway, brainchild of the colonial pioneer Cecil Rhodes. The project met with fierce political opposition from Belgian and other interests who saw it as a threat to the balance of power in Africa. It would have enabled Britain to secure mastery of the entire continent. This was the Indian summer of colonial expansion when Rhodes's successors invited us to follow in the great imperialist footsteps and realise his vision of the civilization of Africa. great railway project by presenting to you Cape Town, the capital city of South Africa and the starting point of the railway. Here we have a bird's eye view of the city, nestling in the shadow of the famous Table Mountain. This is Adderley Street, the main thoroughfare of the city. Saturday morning in the flower market, which is always a very busy time. Five miles out of Cape Town, in magnificent surroundings, is Grutus Kia, formerly the residence of Cecil Rhodes. It was here that his great dream of empire, a railway from Cape to Cairo, had its birth. A tremendous project. Half a century has gone by since Rhodes conceived his colossal scheme. Let us now review the progress made to join South and North by rail. Northwards was his cry. Here we see the Union Express leaving Cape Town for Kimberley. The first section of this great railway was laid as far back as 1860 and built as far as Wellington, some 57 miles distant. In 1885, the extension to Kimberley was completed, the distance from Cape Town being 720 miles. In the early stages of construction, the native labourer, always very willing and teachable, played a great part. There were certainly plenty of him, his wages were not excessive and he didn't belong to any union but he worked hard from morn till night and the line gradually assumed shape and form. These native gangs are easy to handle. They respond splendidly to training and soon become expert hands in the arduous work of rail construction. You can see how efficiently they pull together and how thoroughly and wholeheartedly they help progress. Here, the laying of the sleepers is quickly and efficiently done. These heavy rails take a lot of handling too but the strong and wiry natives take little heed of the heavy material. And here are gangs completing the sand bedding of the line. What a combination. They could only sing like the vulgar boatmen as they work. After 130 miles, we start a stiff climb up the river valley, reaching an altitude of 3,000 feet. There is a wealth of picturesque scenery visible as we wind round the hills and down into the valley on our way to world-renowned diamond fields. It was at Kimberley that Cecil Rhodes first met Robert Williams, now Sir Robert, a young engineer just out from home, and both became interested in the diamond fields. Here 
are some views of Kimberley. We are now taking you to the famous Westerton mine, originally purchased by Cecil Rhodes on Sir Robert Williams' advice. Here we see the native miners enjoying a little music and dancing. The workers in several of the mines are seen here in friendly competition. Here is the big noise of the dance, the Teddy Brown of the men. He certainly works hard at it. The mines heartily encourage these festive gatherings of the boys, for it provides a safe outlet for any superfluous energy left after a hard day's work above and below. Here we are at Johannesburg the city built on gold, with a population of nearly 200,000 souls. It is 956 miles from Cape Town. Forty years ago, Johannesburg was a collection of tin huts and shanties on the bare felt. But now, the city will compare with any of its size in the world. Here is Eloff Street, one of the principal thoroughfares, with a fine tram service connecting with the mines and the outside settlements. This is Pritchard Street. The city is quite modern and up-to-date and has a fine array of shops, hotels and restaurants. We now reach Freiburg, a pretty agricultural centre and the capital of Bekuana land. It was here that Robert Williams, at the request of Cecil Rhodes, started with wagons in 1891 to report on the mineral prospects of southern Rhodesia. The trek commenced at Freiburg, went through southern Rhodesia and ended at Vara. The report was so full of promise that Rhodes decided to go ahead with the Vara to Bulawayo extension, which, entirely with the aid of British capital, was completed in 1902, joining the Cape to Cairo main route, which had reached there five years previously. The mineral wealth of southern Rhodesia has now been proved to be enormous and includes many rich copper deposits. This is Bulawayo now a prosperous township situated 1,360 miles from Cape Town, with a white population of about 9,000. Bulawayo is an important landmark in the Cape to Cairo line and one of its busiest centres. Here is the main street. Now we have the statue of Cecil Rhodes. The rickshaw boy is still in, in existence, although modern methods, even in Central Africa, are rapidly depriving him of, of his livelihood. Here are the headquarters of the Rhodesian railways and their workshops. Transferring an engine onto the road is a simple affair under these conditions. It was at Bulawayo that the extension west to Lobito Bay was first put in hand, as the copper fields at Katanga were seriously needing railway facilities, and construction northwards on the main line was temporarily held up. The good work of Sir Robert Williams is particularly noted here, for it was his persistence and fixity of purpose that enabled the promoters to make a commencement for this great and important extension. It was commenced in 1903, just one year after Cecil Rhodes' death. Here is the construction train moving out. After a night journey from Bulawayo on the Rhodesian Express, we crossed the Zambezi River by the Great One Span Bridge, which was completed in 1904, and reached the famous Victoria Falls, discovered by David Livingstone in 1855. It is not difficult to imagine Livingstone's feelings when first he saw these immense clouds of spray, described to him by the natives as the smoke that thunders. This is, we think, the first time the famous cataract has been photographed from an aeroplane. 
and it is of special interest because we also see the bridge and the rail track in their intimate relations to the falls. party left Southampton on May the 24th in the Union Castle liner Carnarvon Castle, which included His Royal Highness Prince Arthur of Connaught, Sir Robert and Lady Williams, and many other distinguished guests. Sir Robert Williams, upon whose shoulders the mantle of Cecil Rhodes has fallen, was the hero of the occasion. For the completion of this vast undertaking was the result of his far-seeing enterprise and fixity of purpose. A glimpse of Lomito Bay and its fine harbour on the coast of Angola. The royal party and visitors receiving a very cordial welcome at Lomito. We are now starting on our long journey across the dark continent. There is much excitement at Lomito Station. The departure is witnessed by an enthusiastic crowd. The railway means much to Lobito, for its completion shortens the distance between Europe and Central Africa by several thousand miles. Here we are in the midst of the sugar country. This is another very promising industry to which the advent of the railway is of supreme importance. We are now crossing the bridge into the plantation. This is a pretty shot of the train crossing through the plantation. And here is Katambela Station, the centre of a very thriving district. Our next stop is at one of the landmarks of the line, the Robert Williams Station so-called to perpetuate the name of the man who conceived the great scheme of the railway and saw it through. Loading maize for export. There is a substantial trade in this commodity, and the railway is essential to make the business economic. A pretty shot of the train leaving. effective shot of the train creeping through virgin forests. We are now nearing the coffee plantations and cross the bridge over the Kwanzaa River. native scholars who are disciplined and taught useful trades. Here they are carrying bricks. Here the energies of Sir Robert Williams and other pioneers are being devoted to the fresh discoveries of precious minerals to enable further railway extension east, north and west to complete Cecil Rhodes' scheme. To see what is being done in this direction, we will now proceed by river. And so we board a Congo steamer en route to Stanleyville, the starting point of a number of mining activities. The railway bridge can be seen at the distance. We pass through luxuriant country and cross many rivers. At last, we enter southwest Uganda. This territory has developed progressively and has a great future. In 
the vicinity of Barara, we visit the tin workings at Katengi, the property of Tanganyika Concessions Limited. Here are the boys working a banker drill in swampy ground. This is an edit into the hillside, which you know all about from your crossword puzzles. We cross Lake Victoria to Entebbe, the administrative capital of Uganda. Entebbe is a progressive township in a district rich in mineral wealth. It has great possibilities. Turning north toward the Ruinzori range, we cross the river Mabuko. This river has now been fully explored and flows through very highly auriferous country. Along a first-class motor road, we at last come to the River Nile and ferry across to Juba. Here is the jumping off point of the Nile steamers journeying to Khartoum. Some hours by river amidst the most beautiful scenery until we meet the northern section of the main trunk line running south from Cairo. Here is the swinging railway bridge of Kosti where rail meets road and river once again and marks the end of the less developed zone. This section of the line was originally built to meet the needs of the military operations during Kitchener's expedition. The railway was later extended to El Obeid for agricultural developments and is now the lifeblood of the Sudan. Here we are at Khartoum. The city has a fine river front on which the Governor General's Palace is prominently situated. Here we have a sake at work. This primitive method of drawing water is still much in evidence along the banks of the Nile. These are native tombs in the center of the city. Leaving Khartoum, we cross the Nile by a seven-span bridge. An eight-hour journey brings us to Athbara, the crew of the Sudan government railway system. The railway workshops are quite an up-to-date institution. Here we see engines leaving the yards to go on the road. On this siding is a novelty. This saloon is a church ready to take its minister and staff to the outlying districts. Here is the Padre, ready to start off. We continue our journey northwards by the mail train which runs through the arid Nubian desert on the way to Wadi Halfa. The rolling stock in the finest in the world. Now we steam on our last stretch of river transport down from Halfa towards Shellel, 200 miles away, which is the railhead of the Egyptian state railways. Shortly we pass the famous temples of the Abu Simbel, with their huge figures of Ramesses II cut out of the face of the rock. And here are the ruins of Philae, 
most of which, since the construction of the Assouan Dam, are usually submerged. We visit this famous dam built by Sir Benjamin Baker before proceeding northwards by rail. It is over a mile in width and affects the level of the river for more than 150 miles upstream. The tombs of the kings, including that of Tat Ankh Amen, lie in the vicinity. Then a further 400 miles and our journey is done. Cairo at last. Arriving at Cairo railway station. city of mosques, largest in Africa, and the girdle of Cecil Rhodes is dream. And here we leave you, after our 6,000 miles trip, which we trust has interested and pleased you. Much work still lies ahead in railway development in this continent, but the almost marvellous progress shown in this brief series is clearly only the forerunner of greater effort in the civilization of Africa. The triumphant conclusion of the film belies the truth. Only the southern half of the Cape to Cairo route was actually completed, and to this day the rails peter out somewhere in the Congo. But in eastern and southern Africa, the railways rapidly grew in importance, and we shall now look at the types of locomotive involved. The demand was for ever bigger and more powerful machines, but that seemed impossible because the hundreds of miles of African railways had been built with very light narrow gauge rail for economy's sake and it was out of the question to relay all the tracks. The problem was solved at the Bayer Peacock Company's Manchester Works, when a Mr. Garrett designed a powerful articulated locomotive with twice as many wheels as a conventional engine and a much lighter axle load. It has a massive boiler which, having no wheels under it to constrict its size, can be made large enough to supply steam to what is virtually two separate locomotives, one at each end. The weight is spread over no less than 28 wheels, so the engine can run over all but the lightest of track. The Bear Garrett was an outstandingly successful design, and hundreds of them were sent to nearly every part of the world. One of Bear Peacock's best customers was South Africa, who in 1946 placed an order for 50 Garrett, the steeply graded line through the Drakensberg Mountains to Port Elizabeth in East London. These locomotives were built at the company's famous Gorton Works, where we shall now go to witness the birth of a giant. In 1946, Bayer Peacock invited its clients to pose for an official photograph with the company directors in front of the first engine of the batch to leave the works. Having taken delivery, the South Africans then handed over a cheque, and with its post-war market off to a good start, the company decided to make an export-boosting film of the building of Class GEA Garrett's. The company took great pride in its drawing office, where every order received was designed from scratch. No off-the-shelf loco was ever built here. The firm's reputation was built upon its close attention to the needs of individual customers. Construction starts, oddly enough, with a carpenter. He makes a wooden pattern wheel from which a mould is made for casting. After being poured into the casing, the sand is tightly packed around the pattern wheel by continuous agitation so that no air pockets remain. pegs tapped into the top of the casing are specially located to enable the top to be removed without cracking the mould.
After casting, the wheel has the sand beaten off before being placed on the lathe for machining. These are the most fundamental parts of a locomotive that give it its identity. Boilers, cabs, chimneys and tenders often get changed during a locomotive's career, but the wheels, cylinder blocks and frames generally stay with it for life and have to be made to last. A main frame section is now on its way from the furnace to the drop forge. keen-eyed foreman, who has the shape and size of a garret frame firmly in his mind, directs the operation by the traditional method of rule of thumb, and always gets it right. In the boiler shop, a huge steel plate is being rolled to make the giant-sized garret boiler. After the casing is complete, the boiler has hundreds of fire tubes put in. These men, who seem hell-bent on destroying the engine before it's even half-built, are in fact hammering in the hundreds of rivets that hold the frames together. One of the most vital jobs in the erecting shop is the setting of the valve gear, which is often inaccessible once the engine is complete. A heavy locomotive must have good stopping power. This is one of the outside brake cylinders being lowered into place. Now the traditional tour de force in any erecting shop, wheeling the loco. With a garret, however, the frames are wheeled first and the boiler slung between them afterwards. Both engine units are now ready, and finally the boiler and cab are lowered into place. There only remains now the water tank, which, like the coal bunker at the rear, provided the necessary adhesion weight for the driving wheels. All is now set for a test steaming in the yard on Manchester's only three foot six inch gauge tracks and a trip round Gorton's special bank curve to check clearances. The manufacture of Garrett locomotives continued at Gorton for another 14 years until about 1960 
and many of these locomotives are still in service today, a tribute to the high standards of the Bear Peacock Company, which regrettably was forced to close in the early 60s, owing to a decline in overseas markets. Cecil Rhodes decreed that the bridge over the gorge had to be close enough to the falls for passengers in the Zambezi Express to feel the fray. He never lived to see it, but the bridge was built exactly as he wished, and generations of colonials marvelled at it. Passenger trains have stopped now, and the freight gains little from its routine shower bath, but the bridge still stands as a monument to Cecil Rhodes and the unfinished Cape Takaro Railway. <laughs>